Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Phillips. I'm with Comagine Health here in Utah, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Comagine Health networking event on Utah 211 and how to address social determinants of health. Next slide. We're, we're so glad that you are taking your time to join us for this event. Um, we hope that you're going to get a lot of valuable information from this webinar. Today I'm joined, next slide, by Joan Gallegos and Caitlin Schneider of United Way Salt Lake and Utah 211. We will be recording this webinar and we will be posting it on our website. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the agenda for today. First, we're going to be doing an overview of our Zoom platform. That's actually the internet-based tool that we're using for today's presentation. And then we'll be talking a little about social needs and health outcomes, their background and impact, screening, and referrals to Utah 211. We do ask that you listen closely, and we are going to be asking you to leave in action. And then we'll be closing. Next slide. So let's first talk a little bit about the Zoom platform. Remember, we really do encourage your active participation both in the polls and in chat throughout our event. And we will be addressing your questions at the end, even if you know you have a question for Joan, we will address at the end of her uh, presentation. So let's um, get familiar with Zoom. If you take a hold of your mouse and bring your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a chat button that looks just like the one that you see at the bottom of this screen. If you click on that, another window will open. And there you can type to all the panelists and attendees. We do ask that you consistently do that, except if you have a question specifically for Joan or Caitlin, please put the at sign in that person's name in front of it. We would appreciate that so that we can address your questions appropriately. Next slide. Next, if you could click again, John. So now you're gonna see that this is what your chat book box should look like at this point. And we're going to ask you now to test it. Next slide. So please share with us your name, the names of any others in the room with you, the organization that you work with, and the setting where you work. We'd like to know if you work in a hospital or primary care, home health, or skilled nursing. And we would appreciate if you would chat that in at this point. Now, while you're doing that, we're going to go over the learning objectives. Next slide. Looks like we have some people from the university, Optum, Utah Department of Health. Wow, we're getting a lot of participants in here. Okay, so let's start, talk a little bit about the objectives for today. First, we're going to describe the links between social needs and health outcomes. We're going to identify some resources that are available to you through the Utah 211 link. Um, for your patients with social needs to community-based organizations. And then we're going to describe a strategy to integrate social needs assessment and linkage into the current care delivery processes. Next slide. We ask that as you participate today, you think about these three questions. First, do you in your organization currently screen for social needs? And if not, why not? Second, how do you currently refer patients to community-based services, depending on what their identified needs are? And then last, from what you're hearing today, how can you use that to inform your organization's workflow and help link patients to services? And what is your first step within the next two to three weeks? Now, just a hint, we're going to be asking you about this one again later. So 
Without further ado, we're going to turn this over to Joan Gallegos from Comagine Health here in Utah. Joan? Good, good day, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for this important webinar. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about um, the overview of social needs and social determinants of health, and then we will be turning it over to uh, Caitlin um, from United Way, who's going to really get into the meat of the matter for y'all. But um, with this slide, I just want to give you an overview that you know, really social determinants of health, that's kind of a big name. We abbreviated SDOH, but that really can be used interchangeably with social needs. And you know, I'm maybe gonna show my age a little bit, but we also kind of call it social services too, things that um, um, would be provided um, in the social services sector. So according to Healthy People 2020, uh, that this is a definition of social determinants of health. There are conditions in the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, day-to-day -day functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. So that's kind of a, a wordy definition, but to drill down on it, some examples of social determinants of health um, are um, the availability of resources to meet daily needs. And that could include you know, housing, safe housing, uh, local food, that you don't live in a food desert, that you um, individuals have access to educational, economic, and job opportunities. There's easy access to healthcare services. And just a little brief sidelight there, we found out last week with the Mental Health in Utah report from the Chem Gardner Policy Institute that our access to mental health services, behavioral health services in Utah is the last in the nation. So something to drive some action there. Quality of education and job training. Uh, specifically, you know, you know, if you have a high school education, college education, that also uh, affects uh, your uh, outcome, your health outcomes too, those social determinants of health. Transportation options, that's, that's a given. Um, whether there's um, cars or bus routes or rapid transit, whatever, nutritional support. And if you're hungry, um, don't have adequate um, diet, uh, how can we control um, diabetes? And also social support, loneliness. We're finding more and more loneliness plays a very big role in social determinants of health. So we're gonna do another poll where uh, you all can participate. So if you wouldn't mind, take a couple minutes here. I should say one, one and a half minutes maybe. How often do you screen for social needs with your patients in your practice? And um, that can be all the time on a regular basis, all patients, some patients sometimes not doing anything yet. And maybe you do something else. But if you are doing something else, please type it into chat. So I'll give you a minute. Can you see the results um, on that, um, on the poll? Is it showing up yet? There's still come, people are still answering. I'm gonna give it about five more seconds. Okay, and then you'll um, show the results of the poll. Thank yep. you. Thanks, Jeremy. Displaying now. Oh, there we go. Ah, folks are um, screening a lot of patients on a regular basis and some patients um, uh, sometimes. So uh, we have a very well-informed audience here. Um, that's wonderful to know, so thank you. So here's some background. 
And um, I think many of you might know this if you're screening for these folks already on, on social determinants of health. We know uh, factors such as food insecurity, lack of stable housing, under or unemployment, and other factors really have a very large impact on healthcare outcomes and, and really a bigger impact than medical care. And according to the prestigious National Academy of Medicine, and this is formerly known as the Institute of Medicine, these factors can be responsible for up to 80% of modifiable contributors to healthy outcomes. To me, when I saw 80%, I thought, wow, that really is really a huge proportion. So I think that just emphasizes how important that is. And on the infographic on the right in figure one, um, basically um, uh, you can see um, the social and environmental factors, 20%, um, play a role on, in uh, risk of premature death. Uh, so again, a sizable amount considering um, the other factors like genetics and individual behavior and access to healthcare. So another study found that social deprivation such as poverty, living you know, with not enough income and housing instability were associated with higher hospital readmission rates. And I know that's one thing we work with a lot um, here at Comagine Health is trying to reduce 30-day readmission rates to hospitals. Um, that's a very costly um, revolving door. And so for our hospitals, it's very important when they're doing discharge planning that they also look at the whole spectrum, not just, you know, um, access to outpatient follow-up and medications. And then also patients with um, food insecurity um, have uh, been reported by the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project um, in 2016. Um, folks with those needs cost nearly twice as much as their well-nourished well peers. And this is largely in part to, due to increased hospitalization and higher readmission rates. So um, many studies here are showing that um, social determinants of health play such a large impact in our healthcare outcomes and how we keep people stable in the community. So um, I hope um, with all of this information, uh, it just reinforces in your mind the importance of looking at these issues. Now I wanna talk briefly about um, the drivers for addressing social needs. And um, we're very fortunate that this is becoming more in vogue and that uh, more and more um, healthcare organizations and uh, payers are recognizing this. And um, we are finding that healthcare providers and community-based organizations, there really are new models emerging on this. And uh, many of these are driven by value-based payment models. So in order to um, optimize reimbursement and get the, the most value, um, organizations need to uh, look at the social determinants of health in addition of to, of course, um, delivering high quality health care. And so um, these value-based models really um, look at the benefits on population um, health uh, in that macro level. Um, and that's where the social determinants of health really play an important part. ACOs are really seeing um, the value of the social determinants of health um, because they need to look at the whole person. That's kind of novel idea, right? To look at the whole person. And yay, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, uh, their regulations are easing also uh, because they also are recognizing the important role um, these social drivers um, play in um, healthcare outcomes. You're seeing the Medicare Advantage plans um, that are um, paid through uh, Medicare. They uh, now are offering benefits um, that are kind of more the non-traditional healthcare benefits like nutritional support or transportation. 
um, so that they can wrap around the health care needed for these Medicare recipients. And again, they, they cover these if they are primary, primarily health related. So good to see that that's easing at this point. And we'd like to just give you a brief taste here of some screening tools that are available for y'all um, to look at. Um, and it sounds like um, maybe some of you um, by the last poll are already screening. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, just tapping into our chat if you have a favorite screening tool and that you could share with the audience. But here are some examples of screening tools we found that um, are valuable for um, screening for social determinants of health. Uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, Innovation Accountable Health Communities, Health-Related Social Needs Screening Tool. Uh, that's a mouthful. HRSN for abbreviation. There's a PREPARE, uh, which is the protocol for responding to and assessing patients' assets, risks, and experiences. There's also screening tools available through the American Academy of Family Practice, um, short, short form social needs screening tools. And there's health leads social needs screening toolkit. And finally, um, electronic health record or EHR specific screening tools. So um, we encourage you uh, to look at these resources if you're not already screening and determine one that would best meet your uh, practice settings needs and that can be easily integrated into your workflow. Let's see next. Then I think one uh, key point is whether patients, how do they feel when they're screened? for social determinants of health. Do they feel comfortable with it? Um, and this chart basically shows that um, patients do think screening for social risk is very appropriate in healthcare settings. And the light blue um, shows very appropriate. And you can see the emergency department, 47%, primary care, almost 60%, 59%. Um, and then the uh, total um, uh, and of 969 is 54%. Then if you go down to the next, um, the, the lighter blue after that, or the, I should say the darker blue, or of the uh, robin's egg blue, um, that is somewhat appropriate. So when you look at that, you can see that the vast majority of patients think social risk screening is very appropriate and they're very receptive to it in the ED and in primary care settings. So we wanna just give you a framework or a model um, to use uh, in uh, your practice for screening for social determinants of health. Of course, you would screen using one of your um, tools um, maybe you have a favorite one or one that was on that list. Uh, based on that screening, you identify some issues and you make a referral, obviously with the patient's consent. Um, link those patients then uh, to those uh, social services resources. Hopefully their needs get met. If they don't, then you, know, you go back and make another linkage. But if their needs are met, you make some follow-up and this is kind of a perpetual uh, screening framework because people's uh, needs for uh, social services uh, changes over time. And uh, obviously some people's uh, needs are re -rela really related to their family network too. So it's important, you know, to keep screening um, for this as patients and family situations change. So we're going to do another poll to keep y'all engaged. And here you go. How do you identify where to refer your patients with social needs? So if you would respond, the first choice, United Way 211. Second choice, a community resource list developed by your staff or someone else that you use this community resource list. And thirdly, um, the choice is we haven't started making these referrals yet. 
or finally something else and we would ask that you please type that into the chat box. So I'll let you take a couple of uh, minutes to do that and um, Jeremy, you just let me know when we're getting those responses and I would appreciate it. We'll do, I'll give it about 10 more seconds. Thank you very much. And then, Joan, while people are answering, we did have a couple of comments and questions for you after we conclude the review of the poll. Okay, great. Ending now, and results are up. Okay. It looks like um, the majority of y'all have um, a community resource list developed by your staff or uh, someone else, and um, some of you kind of equal United Way or haven't started making these referrals yet. But we hope to pique your interest mm -hmm. with uh, United Way. So if we do this poll in the future, um, we'll have a bigger blue line. And um, you know what? Um, if uh, I, Sarah, could you read those questions to me? I'm having trouble sure. saying. Sure. Leanne Martin asked this question. She wants to know what are we doing for homeless patients? Skilled nursing facilities are not the solution if they don't meet the criteria. Right. A comment for that? And a comment for that is um, affordable housing is obviously such a key. Um, it's some of those basic Maslow needs, affordable housing, nutritional support. And although, you know, we are making strides in Salt Lake County, um, let's be candid, there is so much more work that needs to be done on this. So in order to address the homeless um, problem, we really need to um, increase awareness of the uh, need for affordable housing, um, for job support, nutritional support. Um, causing uh, homelessness is a very complicated program, uh, problem and uh, really requires a lot of drivers to meet that. But uh, we need to keep working on that. Keep working with your legislators to get money directed to that. Another question, Sarah? Um, we have a comment from okay. Jane um, that beginning in January of 2020, all of the Intermountain primary clinics will be screening patients annually for SDOH as part of the comprehensive intake. That's great to hear. And they're using Perhaps. a version of PARA, P-A-P-R-A, PARA. Uh -huh, that was one of our screening tools. Congratulations. Um, Intermountain um, always has been a leader in screening and uh, thank you for um, sharing that. Um, just a big uh, call out and uh, kudos to Intermountain. They've done a great job of screening for depression and that's been one of their community needs. And for that reason, Utah really has a a pretty high rate of screening for patients. Um, with our high suicide rate, depression screening is so important. So I expect, um, as Intermountain being a leader um, in this area, uh, we'll expect uh, to, to see some more good work out of your company on that, and we'll be interested in following the results that you see from that screening. Anything else, Sarah? Um, looks like Tiffany said that they use Epic, um, and then we have a couple of individuals who typed in that they already are using United Way 2111 on their um, screening. And we have one from Margaret that they use lists compiled by a coworker and they're looking at other resources. Great. And Great. there's a question from Maria about what about Salt Lake County? in terms of their resources for social determinants of health? Looks like that question was for Jean, maybe. For what, I'm sorry? Looks like the question may have been directed to Jean. Okay, okay. All right, well, you know, that's kind of a nice segue because what about Salt Lake County? Because my um, co-speaker here um, is really gonna talk about a lot of resources for Salt Lake County and others too, so. Um, it's a good segue for me to turn it over. We're delighted to have uh, Caitlin Schneider from United Way 211 here to present. And I'm going to turn the baton over to you, Caitlin. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Um, again, like she said, my name is Caitlin Schneider. I'm the Partnerships Director at United Way of Salt Lake. 
Um, but Utah 211 is a statewide system, um, which makes us unique. Um, a lot of other states, 211s are kind of broken up um, into different uh, segments or geographic areas. So, for example, California, there's a 211 in San Diego, there's a 211 in Ventura, there's a 211 LA. Um, and they're not really connected systems. But in Utah, we are one joint system, um, which makes us really effective at what we do um, because we're all utilizing and, and sharing the same information. So um, we do have a call center here in Salt Lake. Um, that's where my office is at. We have another call center down in Utah County. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we kind of split that up. But um, here's kind of the, the overview of what I'm going to share with you today. Um, it's just a, a brief overview of what 211 is and what we do if you're not familiar. Um, an understanding of how to connect to the services that we can offer and how then you can also help link your patients uh, to those services. So um, just as the quick overview of what 211's mission is in Utah, um, this is our mission statement and our, our mission is to inform decisions, to build connections and to empower Utah. Um, and we do that through three different audiences that we're gonna talk about, um, which is the people who need help. So, you know, first and foremost, we wanna make sure that the people who need to access services and resources are able to get access to those resources if they're available. Um, we also really uh, work to work with the people who help the people who need help. So folks like all of you, providers, um, community-based organizations, um, a big part of my work as a partnerships director is really to, to form those relationships to improve the system for the people that are trying to access those services to make sure that it is accessible and that it's easy for people to navigate. Um, and then the third group is kind of what we've been alluding to as well for the people who make policy and give funding for services used by the people who need help. Um, so something we hear often is, you know, especially in rural areas where there's just not the services available for folks. Um, how can we use the data that 211 collects based on the needs that people are calling about or connecting with us for to really inform policy decisions, um, policy makers, funders, um, to provide them with that knowledge about what's not available um, so that uh, they can use that information um, for their benefit as well. And we'll talk more about that too. So many of you have probably seen this if you're in the in the healthcare world, um, but this is Maslow's hierarchy, and and really two one one we really focus on those bottom two levels. So, like we said, basic needs, food, shelter, um, safety, health, personal um, security, employment, um, things like that. Those are really where two one one's focus lies, and what we're trying to help connect people to. Um, because we know that if they don't have those basic needs met, that, you know, achieving those higher levels of, you know, being all that they are capable of being um, is going to be really, really difficult. So, 2 on one really focuses on, on helping people meet those basic needs. And that feeds right into 2 on ones vision, um, which is, it's a lofty goal, we know that, um, but we really really want um, to help ensure that every person in the state of Utah has their basic needs met, including things like I just mentioned, shelter, clothing, food, access to health care, um, and personal safety. Um, so here's kind of a, a quick look at our database and the services that are included in there. Um, so we've got over 2,700 providers, um, and we're always adding more as we come across them. Um, that meet about 9,600 different services. So the providers themselves are the actual organizations. Um, and then within each organization, they may provide multiple services. That's kind of the difference between those two numbers. Um, so for example, uh, you know, a program like Community Action, they provide a lot of different services. So they're one provider in our database, and then they would have multiple services listed underneath their organization. So That's kind of where those numbers come from. And those services in the database are, are, again, related back to a lot of basic needs uh, services. Um, and so here's just a few examples we've already talked about and mentioned as related to social determinants of health, things like housing, emergency food, um, utility assistance is a big one, health, mental health, as Joan mentioned, substance abuse, legal aid, government services, transportation. Um, and we'll talk a, few, a little bit more about some of those specific partnerships that we have as well with some of these types of um, services. 
But just a few more uh, kind of quick facts about 211 in the state of Utah. Um, our services are available 24 seven. Um, like I mentioned, we have the two call centers, one here in Salt Lake, one in Utah County. Um, our call center covers basically Salt Lake County and North. Um, if you kind of drew a straight line across um, underneath Salt Lake County. And then Utah County covers um, the rest of the state. Um, we do have a partnership also as well with United Way of Northern Utah. They don't have a call center um, up in their Ogden location, but um, they do help us with database updates for the organizations in their area, as well as outreach. Um, we can provide services in over 200 languages. Um, most of our staff that are on the phones or responding to texts or chats are bilingual in both Spanish and English, uh, but we do have um, access as well to a language line to translate um, and interpret for other languages. Um, one of the other processes that we've started is that clients have the option to receive a follow-up call. Um, and often questions we get too is about the confidentiality of, of the information that we're collecting. I mentioned we collect a lot of data um, and I'm gonna show you some of that on our website. Um, but we do ask callers a lot of questions. Every question we ask is optional. They don't have to respond um, and we let them know that. And we don't collect anyone's names unless they want to receive a follow-up call. So asking for their name simply just lets us know who we're trying to get a hold of when we're trying to do that follow-up. So if we're calling the household that we're getting a hold of the right person. Um, so we do offer a follow-up. Uh, we usually tell them, you know, within five to seven days after they've made that initial contact that we would like to follow up with them if they so choose um, to just make sure that the resources that we referred them to, they were able to get connected. Um, and if they weren't, if there's more troubleshooting we can do um, or some advocacy to do on their behalf to help them get connected, we're, we're willing to do that. Um, or it serves as an opportunity if in that follow-up they say, yeah, I did get connected, um, perhaps then we can use that to address an additional need. So uh, oftentimes, you know, we, we ask them kind of what's your priority need that you need to deal with? Is it food? Is it housing? And then once that's taken care of, let's focus on other um, kind of secondary needs. Maybe it's child care or clothing or something like that. So that also provides an opportunity to follow up with them. And then we do have the ability to direct transfer to other organizations. Um, so homelessness came up as a question. Um, we do have a partnership with uh, Utah Community Action, who's now serving um, as a separate phone line to help uh, place people into one of the resource centers. And um, we do have uh, a feature now when people call into our system, uh, because they're aware that a lot of people were calling 211 specifically for that. And so now people will actually just be able to get directly transferred to that line so that uh, community action can help them find where there is an open bed available. Um, as well as especially things like uh, mental health, suicide um, related calls, we do train our staff so that they're prepared um, to take those calls because we do get them. Um, but we can direct transfer over to like the uni crisis line um, to more um, experienced professionals to help in those types of situations as well. Um, so just a kind of overview of how people are accessing 211. Um, I mentioned we have several different modes uh, of connection. Um, so you can see that top blue line is calls, chats, and emails, which has actually been on the decline over the past few years. Um, and you can see that's really kind of been replaced um, with our website and app searches that have really shot up, um, which is great. We want people to use the technology that's available and there's some really great resources through those uh, modes of communication. Um, but we do realize that there's, there's an importance oftentimes of connecting with, uh, with a person. Um, our information specialists are really great at what they do in, in asking those deeper questions. And sometimes people are calling and they, they're not really sure what they need. Um, but they know that they, they are in need of some type of services and information specialists can really ask some questions to figure out what it is that they're looking for and help guide them to the best place as possible. And this is some of our referral outcomes. So I mentioned that we do those follow-up calls um, where we're finding out if they've had their, met, their need met or not. Um, so you can see most of the time they have had their need met um, either through another agency or through the, the service that we referred them to. Um, but that third one is the one where we really focus our efforts is that uh, they plan to reach out to the referral that we provided them, but they haven't yet. Um, so we, we do a lot of research, especially in um, conjunction with the University of Utah, where they look at our follow-up data and, and propose uh, 
ways for us to even improve our services so that that barrier of people following up on their own um, maybe isn't so tough. So um, we're always consistently looking at our processes too to see how we could do that better and maybe um, warm transferring folks uh, to the service specifically. Um, so like I mentioned, we do have some key partnerships and these are just a few. This is not an extensive list, um, but some of the main ones um, that we work with. Um, so some of you may be familiar with Help Me Grow. Um, that's an organization that's actually based out of United Way of Utah County, but they are statewide for the state of Utah that work with um, families and children zero to eight that may be experiencing um, developmental dis disabilities um, or parents that just have questions um, about their child's development. We partner with UTA to help people get transportation um, and can do some mobility management, especially for those um, that are over the age of 65. Um, we also have a new partnership with Lyft um, that many of you maybe have heard about, um, but if you haven't, um, we do have a partnership with Lyft and United Way Worldwide to be able to provide rides for folks that maybe don't have any other options. Um, so UTA is not an option for them and they need to get to something pretty immediately. So whether that's a healthcare appointment, uh, maybe a job interview, um, a benefits type uh, service, we can actually send a Lyft ride directly to go pick them up. Um, so that's something new that we're just starting. Um, Take Care Utah, many of you know, um, is kind of the statewide navigator service um, that helps people sign up for health insurance. So we directly can connect folks to their closest navigator. Um, as well as Utah Tax Help during tax season, we schedule tax appointments for folks um, at one of the free sites uh, if, they're, um, if they make less than $55,000 a year. Um, I won't focus too much on emergency management, but just know that we do train our staff as well as our United Way volunteers to um, be able to respond in the case of uh, a large disaster or mass casualty event. Um, and we work with state and local governments to make sure that they're aware of that and can call on us if, if they would ever need us to start taking public calls about a certain situation. Um, one example is actually the Sandy, um, when Sandy had their water um, little mini crisis there for a bit um, with the lead and the copper in the water, uh, we were actually called upon to, to take some excess calls because their public information officers cannot work for 48 hours straight, so they needed a break and they called on 211 to help take those calls, which we're happy to do. Um, I mentioned University of Utah in terms of research. We also have a project in their emergency department where they actually directly refer um, after they do an assessment, um, like we're talking about, for social determinants of health. If a patient screens positive, they actually feed that information directly to 211 um, within our system so that one of our information specialists can actually follow up and, and connect with that person to help get them connected to community-based resources. And then on the substance use side, uh, the Department of Health in Utah actually asked 211 if we would be the state designated helpline for substance use disorder. Um, and we already had substance use disorder information in our database. And so we're just um, expanding that now um, to make sure that we have everything in there um, and, and can help connect folks to those services. Okay, so I'm gonna actually take you onto our website real quick so that I can kind of just show you um, how to navigate through it. Um, and again, like I, I mentioned before, there are lots of different ways people can connect with us, not just through calling 211. We do have an app that you can download for free um, in the App Store or on um, Android devices. Um, we have the texting option. So our texting number is 898-211 which the 898 stands for TXT, so text 211. Um, we also have an online chat, which we've heard um, from some providers in meetings we've been in the last few weeks that they actually really like this chat feature. Um, you know, if they're working directly with a patient in their office, they maybe don't have time to search through the database and find the resources, they can just click that chat button, chat live with one of our information specialists and help get their patient connected to the resources. Um, and we do have email as well. Um, but here on the website, you can actually navigate through all the services um, that are the same services that all of our information specialists can see throughout the state. And again, this is statewide. So I could start up here and type in a specific zip code of my area um, or my county. Um, all the counties in Utah are listed here. Or um, you could click into each kind of one of these general um, categories of needs 
and find what you're looking for. Or you can enter a custom search word down here. So if you know, you know, you're specifically looking for um, like lead paint removal in a house or something like that, you could search that here instead of searching through the housing bucket. Um, but I'll just kind of go in here real quick to show you just what one um, resource might look like. So we've talked a little bit about um, the homeless shelters or the resource centers. Um, so again here, this is where it's going to start popping up all of the different services. So I could go in and click on one, I'm just going to pick the first one. And then under here, it's going to show me all the information about that resource. So their contact information, their website, a map to their location. Um, and then each of these can can kind of expand out. So again, this is one of those organizations, they provide a lot of services. So there's a lot of things listed under here. Um, so if I was interested in laundry facilities, I could expand this out. It's going to tell me the hours of that specific service, who's eligible, the cost, um, what the procedure is, who they serve. So there's a lot of great information that lives in here. Um, and our database team makes sure that this stays up to date uh, throughout the year. Um, if I wanted to go back, you could also narrow your search um, based on geography. Once I get got to this page, I could go to this little button right here and add a location or other options to look through that um, as well. So that's kind of what this looks like. Um, I will say one of the other resources is we do have these county resource lists and it's under up here under resources. So if you're interested in having kind of uh, pre-printed out lists available in your office, these are here on our website. Uh, the larger counties, we have broken them up into more specific lists because otherwise the list would be very, very long. Um, so like Davis County, for example, if I click here, there's a general resource list and there's also a health specific list in there. Um, same thing for Salt Lake County. We have even more because Salt Lake mm -hmm. County is so big and there's a lot of resources. There's general, there's dental, food, health, homeless, um, and single parents. So these are available on the website. These were all just updated um, for 2019. So those are here available for you to use um, and to download and print out if you'd like. Um, the other thing that I'll show you, and Comagin has done a great job of preparing a toolkit um, for all of you, is that we have this tab up here under our About Us section that's called Our Work. Um, and if you click on this, this is where a lot of that data that I mentioned is living um, and kind of living and breathing so that you guys can access it um, and see what's going on in your communities. Um, specifically. So this first tab up here is 211 caller information. So if I don't change any of the filters and I just scroll down here, it's showing me how many um, interactions we've had and what some of the demographics are. So like I said, these are some of the questions that we ask folks. Um, if this was their first time contacting 211, if anyone in the household is currently looking for work, if they're already receiving government assistance, do they have a disability? Do they have children? And so these are the percentages. Um, and then down here, um, and again, I haven't made any selections about need or anything like that. So these are our general um, overall statistics for all of our contacts. Um, you can see a breakdown by race, ethnicity, um, household income, level of education, and their household composition right there. But what's really cool about this resource is up here, you could select um, by certain demographics. So if I wanted to look at just who are the folks that are calling about housing, I could select housing as the need right here. Um, if I wanted to look just at a certain county, I could select the county right here. Um, and then on this other tab right up here, um, if I click over to this, and sometimes it takes a moment because there's a lot of live data living within here, um, but this can actually show me the top 10 needs. So if I don't know necessarily what the needs are in my community or my county, or a certain zip code even, I can enter that here. So as I scroll down, and this is showing just without entering any of that information, what are our top um, service needs? So what are people calling about that they're looking for? And what are the zip codes that we get the most number of calls from? Um, but if I wanted to go in here and just select my county, Salt Lake or Daggett County or wherever I'm doing my work, I could select my county or even a city or a zip code 
and be able to see the same um, level of information down here. Or if I was specifically interested in veterans, I could select that here, a certain race, ethnicity, gender, age. There's lots of different options for you to go in here and search data. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the website. Um, like I said, our information is kept confidential. Um, so none of the data obviously that's shown here, um, it's all in aggregate. So there's no personally identifiable information. I know that can be a concern for folks um, in our database that where we do keep that information is secure. Um, so I'm gonna flip back here to the PowerPoint. And we'll make time for questions at the end as well. Um, but just one other thing I want to highlight, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to kind of skip through some things, is that we do have a widget. Um, oh, let me go to slideshow. Okay. So we do have a widget available. Um, so you could reach out um, to myself. And this is actually a little search bar that could be made available for your organization's website. Um, so it would just look like this. It could live on whatever page you so choose. We would just provide you that HTML code. Um, and then right there, people could search in the keyword, their zip code, and then it's going to just redirect them to the 211 uh, website to be able to find the information that they're looking for. So that's another option that's also available to you. Um, and then this is just some other information. I won't harp on it too much because, again, I'm running a little bit short on time. but. Um, we're really looking at a model um, that's been started uh, by 211 in San Diego, where they're really trying to create this community wide network um, so that all healthcare providers and community based organizations and other systems like the homeless system, the jail system, um, EMS, police could all communicate with each other and clients would have kind of one shared record so that again we can we have that holistic view of a person and not just their healthcare needs. Um, but what else um, they might be needing in their life to help them connect to. Um, so again, and, and that process really looks at how can we reduce, you know, healthcare utilization, improve efficiencies in the system, and ultimately lead to better health outcomes. And with that, um, here is my contact information, and we'll share that with you as well. Um, my other offer is that we're, we're happy to come out and do more in-depth training. I know I just briefly kind of ran through the website, um, but there's other training we can provide for your staff and how to create an account, add favorites, create your own resource lists um, within our website so that you're always getting the most live accurate information from the different services. And we're happy to come out to your individual organizations and, and train staff in how to do that. So there's my contact information. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Joan. Okay. Caitlin, we did have a couple questions here. Um, we had a, a comment about what resources are available for Davis and Weber, but I believe you addressed that. And then a comment about the importance of community health workers in this system. And then we had a question for you from Leanne. Would this resource apply to Medicare as well, the Medicare population? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We actually, um, in the website, there is even a, a specific category um, specifically for older adults um, and services available to them. Um, yeah. And then one from Danielle, um, can you give us more information about Lyft? Is it free and is it free to all customers from Maria? Yeah, so the partnership that we have with Lyft, we were provided some grant money. So we do have a limited amount of funds at this time that we're able to use for that service. Um, but again, we, we really work with folks to walk through other options and kind of ask them those questions to see if we can help um, them navigate the UTA um, mobility site. Um, if that's not an option and it's really an emergency need, um, then we can coordinate with Lyft. But yes, it would be free to the client. Um, we would just draw down um, the grant funds that we have available for that. And then Tiffany asked if they refer a patient to 211, do you give them any information on the resources and follow up to close the loop? So they mean back to the, the provider? Back to the provider. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we didn't really get to that. So I think that the big, the ultimate dream and, and that we're, we're convening a group of folks from lots of different organizations. Some of you, I know I recognize your names on the webinar are involved in this group. Um, we do have a social determinants of health group that meets 
um, about every other month right now and trying to build out that system like um, what I mentioned with 2 in 1 San Diego and similar to what um, Intermountain is already exploring with their Alliance project and, and making sure that that information can be fed back um, to those folks that refer them. Um, so the, yes, that is something that we're, we're working on um, and, and figuring out how to, to integrate different technologies because like you've seen in the chat and things, people are using a lot of different systems um, and different assessments. And so San Diego's model is really about um, having one shared consent form so that patients would opt into the system. And then once they're in kind of this, we call it a community information exchange. So it's not just health information, it would be larger and there would have to be a lot of discussions about privacy and how, what information is shared with who. Um, but we're having those conversations to figure out how to build a system like that in Utah so that um, we can close the, the loop and find out if they've received the services or not. Okay, so um, looks like one more question and then we'll probably need to go to Joan um, just based on our time. Um, there's a question from Kathy. Do we just have our patients call or chat with you? Yeah, either one. Um, so I made the mention of the chat because um, we heard from some providers that that was easier for them if they were trying to help connect like a patient to a service. They liked the online chat feature, um, but patients could do that themselves. Um, they could call us. Um, we do have people that call on other people's behalf um, and that's okay too. Um, but we do like the individual to call because we want to be able to ask them those deeper questions so that um, we can really figure out what they need, what they might qualify for, um, so that we're not offering them resources that maybe, you know, they're not going to meet income guidelines or things like that. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Caitlin. We do have one more question, but we will follow up with that following um, the webinar and um, get an answer to Maria as she would please put her email address in um, and just chat that to the panelists um, so that it's not public to everyone. And then we'll turn it over to Joan. Okay. Thank you. Very well done, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, Every time I listen to you, I learn something new and it makes me want to go in and play on your website. Uh, it's very fascinating and important information you shared, so thank you. Well, we also want to tell you about our Comagine Health PDSA Quality Improvement Toolkit. And Sarah Phillips has um, put that in uh, chat in the link. But to help you get started, um, with your social needs screening, or if you're already doing it and you want to maybe improve some of how you're doing things, um, we developed a quality improvement toolkit. We love quality improvement here. And this toolkit takes you through the PDSA process that's integral to quality improvement and uses data from the United Way 211 website. And through this toolkit, I think you will be able to identify the most prevalent social need in your area and use that as a place to start. So uh, we encourage you after this webinar to um, look at this toolkit. And if you have any questions or needs help, um, we're the Quality Improvement Organization and we're glad to help you with that. So we're gonna have one last poll. Um, after now hearing about the impacts from this webinar of unmet social needs and how they really directly impact healthcare outcomes, um, how confident are you now that you can integrate some of these processes of screening and referral into your workflow? And there's a series of uh, answers, very confident. You might already be doing it. Fairly confident, unsure, not confident, and if you're not confident, we're here to help you, Caitlin or Comagine Health, or other, and you can please type that into chat. So let's have um, wait uh, a few uh, minutes or a few seconds, rather, Jeremy. Um, let me know when um, we get some good responses in, and I will summarize those um, for the audience. We'll give it about 10 more seconds for everybody. Ah, thank you, Jeremy. All right, closing polling now and results are up. 
Yay! <laughs> That's what we were hoping for. Very confident, the blue line, um, orange line, uh, fairly confident. That's the vast majority. It looks like um, that's close to 80%. Unsure, um, there is a few of you that are unsure. Those that of you that are, I encourage you to reach out to Caitlin or us at Comagine Health. We're there to assist and help you. So glad that we had those results. Looks like we were all successful. So um, what best practices or lessons learned can you share about your experience of screening and referring for social needs with your patients? Um, any insights that you've gained from this discussion or any last, last minute questions or comments? And if you would just um, enter those into chat and I'll give you a minute or so to do that. And Sarah, um, if I could ask you to maybe monitor the chat and let us know um, what is being placed into that chat room. Certainly. Thank you. Um, we have a comment from Kelly that it was very eye-opening. Yay. She didn't realize the extent of the 211 program and a thank you. Um, looks like someone's looking for the toolkit. I'm going to put that back in um to the the chat so that everyone can access that and then from rebecca we have a comment learned a plethora of places to get assist get information for assisting our patients 211 is a great resource and margaret says i think i can really help clients foc focus in on their the ease of and accessibility of 211 Sounds great. Good. Sounds like we've got a group of folks that are feeling pretty confident and are ready to move forward on a very holistic screening of our patients. So thank you. Um, yes. Jody Porter has, I always ask, do you feel safe where you live? I was surprised when someone answered, I always say yes, but I'm usually lying. I was so glad I didn't skip that one that time. I think that's an excellent example of how it's so important um, to really ask these questions and then be prepared um, to enter into discussion if you get an answer, such as uh, that individual did from um, that patient. And uh, hopefully uh, some of the things you learned today uh, can help that patient feel safer in their home environment. Absolutely. Um, for Maria, she's asking if we're going to be sending a copy of the webinar in an email. We actually did in the chat box put the link to our YouTube site where the, the webinar will be posted. Um, Joan, were we planning on sending the slides out? Yes, um, I believe they will be posted on our website too. Okay, and then I'm um, I'm not sure I know exactly what this question is, um, but we had a question for Julie about the time frame for feedback. I'm wondering if that's feedback on the 211 website. Could you maybe clarify that, Julie? Or Caitlin, or I, if you want to take a stab at it, Caitlin. Yeah, I'm not sure. What they're asking. Yeah, I'm not either. I'm sorry, that was from Emily. Julie Day would ask the question. Um, we'll see if we get some feedback on that. Okay. Um, we had a comment from Carrie, the hardest population is the homeless with chronic illness and addiction. I think we'd all agree with that. Yeah, bingo. And Emily says, uh, when a patient is referred, do we have a feedback on the results? That's a clarification to Julie's question. Uh, so does the provider get a feedback? If, yes. I'll yes. turn that over to Caitlin. Yeah, so right now, no. Um, I think that would be 
So that's where I'm saying I think we're trying to create this better system statewide so that we can provide that feedback um, because oftentimes, um, you know, we're just following up directly with the client to see if they got referred, but we're not communicating back with maybe someone who initially referred them to us um, because we don't typically track that information. Um, but in building a, a statewide system where we could actually have electronic referrals come into 211, we could see who that comes from, work with the patient that they referred us to, and then share that information back to, to if they got connected or not. So the, the pilot project I mentioned with the University of Utah Emergency Department, um, they do get some feedback um, because they're directly referring patients to us. Um, and so, like I said, if you're, if, you're, if that's of interest to you, we're always looking for other partnerships and ways to, to help you do this type of work. Um, so we are doing that in, in a way with the emergency department where they're directly feeding that information to us. One of our information specialists is following up with the clients they send us. Um, and then we can provide the data back to them to say who got, um, you know, who received services or not. And so nice to know that you all are, you know, looking at that San Diego model and other ways to improve. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the invitation's out there from yeah. United Way to, you know, look at some innovative ways of doing some things. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yep. Um, we have one qu one more question. Do you network with VOA? And we're right at our time limit, so we're we're not going to be able to address any further questions after that. Yeah. Yes. So yes, we do work with VOA. Um, they are in our network. Um, I've actually, what does that stand for? Um, volunteers of America. Oh, VOA, Volunteers VOA. of America. I thought yeah. it said GOA, Volunteers of America. Yes. No, no, John. It was just my Eastern accent. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. I should have understood it. Okay. But Thank yes, you. So they, they are in our system. I've met with someone in person there um, about how to increase referrals to their organization. So yes, we do work with VOA. That's good to know. They're a great organization too. Great. Well, here's some uh, last slide. And again, you can access um, these um, on our website. And Sarah um, said she provided a link earlier. But here's some more information. 211, I'm not going to go all through. Siren, AAFP, addressing social needs and health. SDOH and primary care, variety of other things. Um, this webinar is posted to our YouTube, YouTube channel. Sarah has that in the uh, chat room and uh, there's a lot of good resources out there if you wanna learn more. So leaving an action, begin your journey with one small step. Use our Comagine Health Toolkit that's linked in the chat room to get you started. And as we conclude, I'd like you to take this away. What first step can you take in the next few weeks to integrate or enhance social needs assessment and referral in your organization? So noodle on that one for a little bit. And we are out of time. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending and for the, the pretty robust uh, discussion we had in chat. I uh, appreciate it. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank our guest speaker, uh, Caitlin Schneider from uh, United Way 211 for an excellent presentation. Thank Please you. reach out to us if you need any further help. We'd love to help you get started on this important topic. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. Uh, please complete the post-event survey. We can't forget that. And let us know if you'd like additional information or to be linked with United Way of Salt Lake 211 for additional technical assistance. We really would appreciate your feedback on the post-event survey. It helps us as a quality improvement organization do better in the future. So thank you.